Hi everyone, it's going to be a very chatty one today. I filmed a video around this time last year, maybe a bit later actually, saying let's talk about life while I clear out my wardrobe. I filmed one a few years ago saying let's do origami and talk about things. So today I am going to be making something which I'll talk to you about in a second and I also just want to talk to you about life things. As an aside, before we get into life stuff, um, does anyone else feel like their smart speaker is judging them? I don't know if it is or if I have been watching too much Black Mirror, reading too much dystopian. I am reading Clara and the Sun at the moment, so that may have something to do with this, but I've been feeling this way since way before I was reading that book. So for context, Mr. M and I during the times that we find ourselves in, have been playing lots of board games and we tend to play a game of battle line every lunchtime because it takes five minutes to play and it's got to that point where it's a game that we like playing but you're not thinking about it too much while you're playing it. It's great. Anyway, so we always ask our smart speaker to flip a coin before we start playing to see who's going to begin the game and that's fine, right? Every day, heads, tails, whatever. And then one day I asked the smart speaker to flip a coin and it said no. And I thought, oh, they can't have heard me properly. So I asked again and they said, why don't you flip a coin? Oh, excuse me, doorbell. How cute, those flowers from my mum, I'll show you in a bit. And we've taken it in turns to kind of send each other flowers during this past year. Not very often, but you know, every couple of months. So that's really sweet. Anyway, um, what was I saying? Yeah, so I asked the smart speaker to flip a coin and one day they said no. So I asked a second time and they said, why don't you flip a coin? So I asked a third time and it sighed and it said, I'm a very intelligent device and all you ever ask me to do is flip a coin, which also is not true, not the intelligent part, but they're only asking it to flip a coin. And I was, I wanted to pick it up and throw it out the window. <laughs> like, I really did. Um, I know that it's a programming thing, it's programmers having a bit of fun, right? If the device has asked this question a hundred times, make this be the response. So I was like, okay, well, they've had their fun now. I'm sure that won't happen again, but it does. It keeps happening, but it's different every time. And it won't be every day. It'll be once every couple of weeks when I say flip a coin. One day it said, I've lost my coin. <laughs> One day I asked it and it said, I don't feel like it. And it really, I don't know. I mean, obviously it's just the way the world is at the moment. Like it is funny, but also not funny really not funny. I didn't enjoy it. My fault for getting a smart speaker, clearly going to take over the world. My goodness. Anyway, let's talk about why I have this material here and what I'm going to be attempting to make this afternoon. And it involves a little bit of a story time. So this time last year, Mr. M and I started going for walks at 5am every morning. A year ago last week was when I started shielding. So it's been over a year of shielding for me. And 5 a.m. was the only time of day that I knew I could leave the flat and not run into people. So we were getting up early, crack of dawn, sometimes before dawn, going out and walking for about 45 minutes and coming back home. And then we'd be inside for the rest of the day. And we're really lucky. We live in London, but there is a small wood nestled at the end of our street, which feels otherworldly. And that has been so precious to us these past, well, this past year. Um, and oddly, it has fed into something that I'd been thinking about for several years anyway, which is how I process things, how my mind works. I'm very pattern based. I constantly draw parallels between things trying to make sense of stuff and I think that writers do that. It's why we are writers. We are constantly drawing lines. You know, if this happened, what knock and effect would that have here? Um, and I think humans do that to some extent 
anyway. We want to make sense of our own stories, our own narratives and other people's. We want to make sense of the world around us. And when things don't make sense, that's really scary and unnerving. And it's why I love studying the history of fairy tales so much, because stories and folklore like that is often born out of misunderstanding, the need to understand, of fear and trauma. Hansel and Gretel was born out of plagues when people were abandoning their children in churches because they couldn't afford to feed them. Hans Christian Andersen wrote The Little Mermaid because he was in love with his male best friend and he wrote a story about wanting to be like everybody else and fit in but having to sacrifice parts of himself to do that and ultimately that would mean he would die. Like there are so many things to talk about there and I've spoken about some of those things in my history of fairy tale series which I'll link in the description box down below but for a while I've been working on a non-fiction book that discusses my um my personal feelings towards storytelling and what fairy tales I clung to as a young disabled child who was in and out of hospital what storytelling meant to me um and the patterns that I saw in the media around me that I was consuming um so a roundabout way of saying this time last year when we were going for our 5am walks I was hunting for meaning everywhere and it was so weird because meaning would seem to present itself and I'm not saying that the universe was telling me things I'm not saying that everything happens for a reason I'm really not saying that at all but I am saying that we will look for meaning and we will take comfort in the meaning that we find and the forest was providing me with so many of those things, which was very, I was gonna say ironic, but mostly just apt given that I was also writing about fairy tales and the importance of the forest and how human beings have historically interacted with forests, why Western fairy tales are mostly set within them, why they're considered to be such a dangerous place where anything can happen in the dark. And we were walking there early in the morning when no one else was there and it really did feel like we were stepping into other worlds. I wrote, was writing pieces about it as it felt like we were walking into the belly of a fairy tale every single morning and I was finding strange things. There was this flower that was carpeting one small part of the forest. I looked them up and they were wooden enemy. Um, let me read you what I wrote actually because that will make more sense. In the forest, we come across a bed of wood anemone. The seeds of this plant are mostly infertile, so stumbling across large amounts of it is seen as proof of ancient woodland. I crouch down to look, feeling the soil underneath, which is soft, and this, according to Lewis Carroll, means that these flowers cannot talk because they are fast asleep. The wood anemone sepals are white, not green, which give the appearance of petals. In fact, they look like pale white buttercups. They are delicate little things. Greek mythology tells us they sprouted from Aphrodite's tears as she wept over the death of Adonis. The Romans believed that the first to flower every spring should be plucked as a charm against infection. Folk would herd the ghostly flowers into their arms, proclaiming, I gather these against all diseases. The flowers would then be tied around the necks of the sick while they prayed. It starts to rain, so I stand up to go home, pulling my coat close to me. The wooden enemy closes itself in wet weather. Folklore would have us believe that this is to keep fairies safe and dry inside their flowers. And even though, like all anemones, the wood anemone is poisonous, it is said to have medicinal properties, especially against respiratory infections. Ingest too much, however, and you will die. In China, they call wood anemones the flower of death. It just felt so strange to research the flowers that I was finding and find this particular flower which was about grief but also about respiratory infections and death and infertility it was very strange given that Covid was happening and um, as I've mentioned briefly before our IVF got cancelled because of Covid um, and that hit me really really hard it hit me so hard because it had been something that had been on the horizon for such a long time you don't just say hey nhs i'd like to do some ivf please and and then that happens it's not that um it takes 
years um, and not only because of funding and the processes you have to go through for that um, but also uh, ethics boards and things because we're doing PGD which is pre-genetic um, diagnostic testing to make sure that the child that we have doesn't have the medical condition that I have and um, for a whole variety of reasons which again I'm, I'm not going to get into here um, so it have been years and not only as I said the funding but also um, medical stuff for me, having scans to make sure that it would be safe for me to be pregnant. So there was a lot of stuff that went on for years and mentally preparing for it. And then we got there and COVID um, and IVF clinics were shut down. And then when they opened again, I was still shielding, am still shielding, so couldn't go. The referral length is now a long time. There was a lot of stuff going on. But Going into the woods, there was something that happened which was so, so bizarre. We were going, as I said, every morning and we started to see this fox cub every day. This fox cub who was quite far away to begin with, very mischievous. Um, it seemed like he would play hide and seek with us. He would literally jump out of the hedgerows and then when we got closer, he would jump back in. He was behaving like a playful dog would and foxes can do that. And especially in London where they are very <laughs> used to hanging out around humans, raiding their bins, they're not scared of humans anymore. So I started to, I suppose, place meaning on this fox, not in a very serious way, but it, it came to mean a lot to me to see that fox cub every morning when we went for a walk, you know. If we saw this fox cub, things may be better. I used to do that as a kid too. I think it's a coping mechanism for many people who have anxiety and especially medical related trauma. Um, you know, you try and come up with these almost magical spells for yourself. Like if I do these things, then things will work out better. And you know that that's not gonna be true, but it's a bit like a comfort blanket. It's like um, why people with anxiety enjoy watching the same things over and over again, because we know what's gonna happen at the end and we can relax more while we're watching it. I used to watch the same things and read the same books all the time when I was a teenager, I think specifically for that reason. So I saw this fox, this is a very long introduction to this video. Hi. Um, I saw this fox every day and every day it started getting closer and closer to us. Obviously we weren't gonna feed it or pet it or anything like that. It was just delightful that it trusted us and it was really lovely. And then one day when we went on our walk, there is a field before you get to the woods. And when we got there, the field was covered in litter. So much litter, cans and plastic bags and bottles. People had clearly had a party the night before and absolutely trashed the place. And um, it was upsetting for a whole number of reasons that someone would trash nature in that way at any given time, but especially when it felt so valuable to everyone who lived nearby, this green space was everyone's sanctuary, right? Um, and when we got there and we saw all that destruction, and our fox cub wasn't there. It was the first day he wasn't there. He'd been scared off by the people who had had this uh, all night party. And I was furious because I hadn't brought any bags or anything to pick up rubbish. Why would I have done that? Um, and I couldn't go around picking everything up. I was shielding. I couldn't touch loads of other things. So Miss M and I said to each other, we'll come back tomorrow and we'll bring gloves and bags and we'll tidy up. So the next day when we went, we did bring gloves and bags. Um, we went to tidy up and someone else had already tidied up quite a lot of it, but there was still some rubbish. So we started tidying up all of the plastic bags, crisp packets, everything. And as we were doing it, the fox cub reappeared and he came out and he was watching us tidying up in this really puzzled way, like, what are you doing? And then when he realized that we were taking the things away, he started to steal the pieces of rubbish. So he would run really close to us and he would take a plastic bottle and then he would run back to the hedgerow and he would hide it somewhere. And it was this game and obviously it felt kind of bad that I was taking his rubbish away that he now wanted to keep, but it's not good for him obviously. So we continued to pick up everything. And then when there were only a few pieces left, he picked up a can and he was chasing around and around. It was almost like he was inviting us to chase him. 
And so we were chasing this fox cub round and round the field trying to get this last piece of rubbish. And eventually he just collapsed in a heap, completely out of breath, looking like a happy, exhausted child. And it was the most peculiar moment. But in that moment, things kind of felt okay. They felt okay. It was a strange moment of joy. So this is all to say in a roundabout way that strange things have happened in that wood that have helped me this past year when things have felt very desperate and not okay. Um, And last week I was very low and went for a walk in the woods. It wasn't at five in the morning, but it was near sunset. So it had this beautiful light and I was walking along and something caught the corner of my eye and I was like, what is that? Um, And I walked into the woods and a family have made some fairy clothes. They'd made some fairy clothes and they'd put them on a washing line and they'd hung them between two trees. And it was just really adorable. You had to know, well, you didn't have to know it was there. I didn't know it was there and I found it, but you you have to be really looking for it. You have to be paying attention to the surroundings to see it. And as I crept around the corner of that washing line of fairy clothes, I realized they'd also made a little wooden fairy door and they'd put it up against a tree trunk with a number seven on it. Seven, very important when it comes to fairy tales. And they'd left that there too. And I just thought it was so wonderful and childlike and amazing. Um, And I decided that I would make some fairy clothes too. And I am gonna attach them to this, some string. And then I'm gonna go to the woods um, this afternoon at sunset and I'm gonna hang up another washing line of fairy clothes in the hope that whichever child put that up, it brings them some joy. Um, when they see that. Let's start with a pair of trousers. Oh, this material, in case you're wondering, I've cut some corners of my, where are they? My headscarves. Because when I wear headscarves, I fold them over the tops of beanies. So I never use them in their loose form. So cutting a bit, a tiny square from each one is actually absolutely fine. So that's what I've done pair of trousers. Mr. M is also going to make a fairy door out of some wood, which he's not going to do today. He's going to do in a day or two. So we can add little bits to this fairy forest as we go. Um, so that there's always new things. Well, not always, but for the next week or so, there are going to be new things for this child to discover. I asked on Instagram for questions. I said I was going to be doing a, a chatty video where I make things and did you have any questions about anything that you wanted to ask me? So I have those questions here um, that you sent in. Um, Someone said, do you prefer cooking or baking? And I'm not sure actually, I think baking is newer to me. I've only done that in this last year really, Um, but I enjoy doing both. And I especially, especially, I especially enjoy blending both of those things. So one of my favorite things to make is kebabs, which I do with the Meatless Farm Company mints and tomatoes and cucumber, garlic sauce and chili sauce, and then I'll make flatbreads. So it's savory and it's cooking, but it has an element of baking. I guess the same with um, things like pizza or or making pasta. I enjoy making pasta from scratch and that is cooking, but it involves, you know, making things with flour. So here's a little skirt. Um, but this weekend, I have made some hot cross buns. Let me show you. And, oh my God, they smell amazing. This is the first time that I've made hot cross buns from scratch. Uh, so they have fruit inside, um, citrus e smell as well. And they have this glaze on top, which is quite um, sticky and you can have them with butter. I like to have them with butter and a little bit of cheese. Not cheese melted on top, just a side of cheese. Is that weird? I don't know. Anyway, I spent a long time making those this weekend because they need to be proved three different times, but I had lots of fun. And I think I will make these in a reading vlog soon so that I can share the recipe with you because I altered the recipe that I was working from because of the ingredients that I had to hand and they worked out really well. So I will share that at some point soon. Someone suggested that I make, um, cause I mentioned on Instagram also that I was gonna make fairy clothes and someone asked if I would make dungarees. 
I mean, I have to make dungarees, right? So I will, I will try and make some. Actually, one of the questions was also, have I purchased anything recently which I love? And that has reminded me that down here is a parcel that has been quarantining that I purchased from Lucy and Yak, where I get most of my dungarees from. So this is not a pair of dungarees. They always send their clothes in uh, material that's been left over from making saris in factories and they make drawstring bags with the saris which are amazing and you can use them for wrapping gifts or keeping your clothes safe whatever I often use them for gift wrapping but what I have bought from Lucy and Yak and what is inside this sari is a jumper I have recently bought two jumpers from Lucy and Yak um, the last one I think I wore in my last video uh, and lots of you said you really liked it, especially because it matched the cover of one of the books that I was holding up. But I bought this other jumper and oh my, look at it. I think it's me in a, <laughs> me in a jumper. It's quite autumnal, I guess, because it does have leaves on and it is orange, but uh, I, I love it. So to answer that question, that's what I bought recently and I'm thoroughly approved of. Someone asked me, is Mr. M's work book related? Absolutely not, it is not. Though, he does work with language. And I don't mean that in a translation kind of way. He's not a translator, he doesn't work with foreign languages, but his job is rooted in language itself. So I guess there are similarities there, but I would say minimal ones. Another person says, what did you study at uni? Where did you go? Was it your first choice? I went to Edinburgh University to study English literature and wherever I was going to go I wanted to study English literature but when I applied I applied also to Cambridge and to Durham uh, and to Nottingham I think and Northumbria. Northumbria was my backup option for if something happened with my health or with anything else and I wanted to stay at home because I'm from the northeast of England and to be fair Edinburgh is not that far away either uh, and Durham I guess is is also not very far away at all um but less commutable I would like a pair of dungarees in this color so yeah I, I got to the interview stage at Cambridge so I did my personal statement all of that stuff and I got through to the interview stage and I have never been so intimidated in all of my life um, it was just so out of my comfort zone. I was from a small village near Sunderland in the northeast, and I thought it was really important to get dressed up. Um, <laughs> I felt like educating Rita or something. I went to Cambridge really dressed up and just encountered lots of people from private schools who were wearing trainers and jeans and t-shirts and clearly hadn't worried about the way they were presenting themselves to go to this interview. So... I realised I was wearing completely the wrong thing, really. I thought that being smart was a good thing, but apparently it not. And, and went to the interview and just completely fumbled my words. Um, I just, yeah, was unprepared for not the, the intellectual questions that they were going to ask me, but just the environment itself. I'd never been in an environment like that before. And I fluffed the interview and I didn't get in. I mean, I ha was predicted to get the highest grades I didn't get in. I was not very good at, I guess, articulating those feelings in the moment. Plus, as I said, I felt very intimidated and I was a shy person back then. I was not a confident person. So it, it was not for me at that time with Cambridge. And I also applied to Durham, but didn't get in there. But the quite nice thing, strange thing, again, trying to find meaning when there is no meaning particularly to be taken from these things is that Mr M also applied to Cambridge and to the same college that I applied to. We had our interview the same day. We didn't meet each other but we had our interview the same day and didn't get in. We applied to the same college at Durham and didn't get in and then we both ended up going to Edinburgh and living on the same corridor in halls and then started dating and got married so you know it all worked out quite well in the end plus Edinburgh as a university is amazing would highly recommend it to anyone had the best time it is the most wonderful city and if I could move back there I think I would kind of on a similar note someone said what is your relationship to your accent speaking as someone whose accent also changes and someone else said 
I've noticed that your voice has changed over the years of you being on booktube. Is this related to your accent or not? It's actually two separate things. So as I mentioned, I'm from the northeast of England. So I did used to have a Mackham accent, not a really, really strong one because my dad grew up down south. Um, my mum's family are from the northeast, but I definitely had a Mackham accent um, or Geordie accent, kind of interchangeable. Um, so I would speak like this. This is how I used to talk. Uh, I used to have an accent like this and I still have such a soft spot for the Northeast accent and can slip into it and I enjoy writing poetry in that kind of dialect and performing that but I don't speak like that anymore and it's not a, a conscious thing that I did. I lost my accent quite quickly after starting university. I'm someone who, when I speak to someone who has a different accent to me, I will often <laughs> imitate that accent which can be embarrassing I think it's an empathy thing and yeah anyway when I went to university nobody else that I was speaking to had a Geordie accent everyone was speaking in lots of different kind of accents and that just meant that I started speaking in entirely different ways uh, and it wasn't because I didn't want to speak like that and nothing like that it just happened and now this is how I talk. I suppose you wouldn't be able to place geographically where I was from. You'd probably assume that I was from somewhere further south, but I still have short A's, so I'd never say bath or path. Very weird, just bath and path. Um, and I don't feel weird about that accent, except for when I go home and I get on a bus and I have to ask for a ticket and I will put on a Geordie accent and say, can I have one of the nuke please? Because I would feel so self-conscious not having a Geordie accent. So that's when I feel self-conscious about it, but not the rest of the time. It's, it's very, very strange. And for the person who said that they noticed that my voice had changed over the past few years, that's not related to my accent. It's actually related to EEC. It's a very, very minor thing, but I have a very dry throat now, which is not really combated by drinking lots of water. It's just the way that my body works. It's related to my eyes being drier and my eyesight and all of that because it's all connected. So I now have quite a gravelly voice, which I didn't used to have. Kudos to you for noticing that though. Okay, so we've got trousers, dungarees and a skirt. Let's make a t-shirt. Someone asked, in fact, I had quite a few questions along the lines of this particular question. What does your sight loss look like for you at the moment? And someone else said, I know that you were learning braille. What um, technology has helped you as well? Okay, so, oh, this is actually quite difficult to cut. So for any of you who are new, I am, losing my eyesight and I have made videos about that which I'll link in the description box down below. Sight loss is a very strange thing because I think or rather I know that society thinks about it in quite a selective way. I think that when we think about losing our vision we think about darkness, blackness, not seeing anything and I think the statistic is something like 90% of people who are blind can or do have light perception, can see certain things that may be just outlines of light or where light isn't. It may be specific colors. It's very rare for you to see nothing at all if you are blind. Um, I'm, as you may be able to tell, nowhere near that at all. But that's just something I wanted to flag before talking about sight loss because I think there are lots of misconceptions of, about sight loss. Um, and I think also when we think about sight loss, we think of it as a painless thing. I don't mean emotionally painless at all, but I mean physically painless, that it's a malfunction and then we just can't see for whatever reason. And that's not the case for me personally. The way that sight loss works for people with EEC syndrome is there are quite a few different factors. As I mentioned with regard to my throat being dry, your eyes become very, very dry. So I have to lubricate my eyes with drops every hour, every day. I can't see in the morning when I wake up unless I uh, use eye drops. I can't open my eyes without them in the morning without getting a corneal abrasion. I have blepharitis, which is a, is a separate issue, but that causes vascularization, which is 
probably the only bit at the moment that, that you personally could see if I showed you my eye. Um, in fact, I'll put a, I'll put a picture here. You wanna see my eyeball? Okay, this is my left eye. Um, you can see the vascularization there, which is the uh, blood vessels, and that's relating to, to having blepharitis. So I have vascularization now that I didn't used to have. My eyelashes grow into my eyeballs, which they didn't used to do. I have lots of corneal abrasions and scarring, and it's particularly bad on my left eye. My right eye is actually doing all right. Got a very rough little t-shirt, two-tone t-shirt. I'll do close-ups of these in a bit. Um, so the, the process of me losing my sight is actually through damaging my eye because the cornea can't replace itself properly because it's so dry and I get all of these, these, these scarrings. And then that transcends into something called limbal stem cell deficiency, which is an incorrect programming in my genetic makeup, which means that like with my hair loss with alopecia, my body will replace the corneal stem cells with scar tissue as a means to protect itself. And there is no cure for that. Uh, corneal transplants don't work. So that whole process is very painful, not just emotionally, but physically. I can't tell you how <laughs> painful it is sometimes. So anyway, what does my eyesight look for me right now? My left eye, it's like, I'm just looking at it and try, <laughs> trying to work out how to describe it to you. It's like constellations. That's how I would describe it. My cornea is so scratched and scarred. I have, it's like having loads of floaters, right? Everyone knows what a floater looks like. Loads of those, but almost like they're joined together by lines as well. So it is like having constellations on my eyeball, which sounds very beautiful, but isn't particularly beautiful. It helps if I'm reading things in a lower light because bright light obviously makes those more visible to me. Um, and it means that it's more difficult for me to concentrate on text and therefore my eye gets dried out even faster and tired and it gives me a headache. But it's not, it's not bad yet, it's just definitely worse than it used to be this past year. It has accelerated quite a lot, which has not been a fun thing to, to have to come to terms with. But as for the question about uh, learning braille, which I am doing because it's easier to do that as a sighted person, it's a good tool to have. But of course, as the rest of the question was, what technology has also helped you? I've been looking into uh, assistive technology just because I want to learn about it in advance. Um, and there are so many amazing things out there. I will actually link Molly Burke's channel down below where she talks about how she uses technology as a blind person. Apple products in particular are incredible for accessibility for this reason. But accessibility and technology is something that I've been thinking about more recently anyway, not just to do with my eyes, but because my hands are deteriorating too, because why would it just be one thing when it could be lots of things? Um, I have been looking at technology-based things and I've been sharing that with some of you and I know that's been helpful, and not just uh, technology-based things, but tools in the house and things that I use in the kitchen, utensils and how that interacts with ectodactyly. So uh, my assistive technology has been for eyes, but mainly, mainly for my hands and it's been interesting to explore that. So I bought a stylus for when I am creating thumbnails, especially on my iPhone and I bought this Sugru, which I mentioned in a favorites video, which is, it's like Play-Doh, but it sets really hard. And this is great for grips if you need a, a better grip on something. Um, for my phone, I've been definitely using voice to text a lot, lot more. That's the primary way that I now use my phone. Um, and obviously anyone can use that. You don't have to use it because your hands hurt or you're finding it difficult to type uh, or you have you know, sight issues, you can use it for any, any reason you want to. And I'm sure that lots of you probably do use that. So for instance, hey Siri, send a text to my mum. What do you want to say? Hi mum, comma, thank you for the flowers, comma, they're really lovely, XX. Your message to mum says, hi mum, thank you for the flowers, they're really lovely, XX. There you go. So, Ready to send it? Yes, I do have my mum in my phone as Mum Campbell. That makes a 
quite a lot of people giggle. Um, but something else that I use, which again may be very obvious, but when I mentioned it on Instagram as accessibility, some people didn't know that this was a thing that you could do and they said that it was really helpful. So if you have um, a message open here, uh, I mean, voice text is just, you press this, so hello, comma, I am speaking and you are typing out the things that I am saying, full stop. I hope that you are having a great day, full stop. New line, new line. What else can we talk about, question mark? Let me show you how else you can type full stop. The voice recognition on Apple products is really good. Um, but what you can do is instead of typing each individual word, you can drag between. So let me, I mean, this is a weird angle, so let me see. So thank you. This is another way you can type. So you can do that instead and that saves you like pressing each individual ones. It's definitely less strenuous to do. Um, and something that I personally find very helpful is using inverted screens where the background is black and then the text is white. That's helpful to do on my computer if I'm looking at um, a lot of text. But yeah, as I said, there's a lot of assistive technology, which is amazing. And a lot of it is not stuff that I, that I need to use now at all, but it's great to be able to learn how that works in advance. Um, and, and know that that's there for me. I've just done four pieces of clothes, but I think I might just leave it at four for now. I'm gonna attach those to this, <laughs> um, and let's go and put the flowers that my mum sent me in a vase, and then we can go to the woods, and we can hang up these fairy clothes. Oh, pals, this is very anticlimactic. I really thought that I had some small wooden pegs to attach this, but I don't. Well, I have various different paper clips and I don't want to leave those in the woods because, you know, they're sharp. I don't want any animals hurting themselves. So I'm gonna order some small wooden pegs online and when they come, I can finish this and then go and hang it up in the forest. So if you would like to see the final um, project, then you can follow me on Instagram, keep an eye over there. I will post a picture when it's completely done. I may make a few more items of clothes as well, and I'll share a picture of the fairy door that Mr. M is making too. But before we disappear, I'll uh, show you the flowers that my mum sent me. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm not really sure how to categorize it, apart from, I suppose, life chats, life update, whilst making some fairy clothes. Um, I would love to know how you are in a comment down below. Please tell me. Let's have a chat. Um, and I will see you for another bookish video very soon. Sending lots of love. Bye.